Hello everybody, another top 10, this time my top 10 metal finds. Now I may have mentioned before that I'm really not very good at finding metal, um, maybe because I'm looking all the time for pottery. So it's taken me about 15 years to find 10 interesting things um, which are made of metal. So without further ado, let's begin. Oh, the other thing is uh, a lot of them are very small, so um, I won't be holding them up to the camera. I will just be filming them as they are here on my desk. So without further ado, number 10 is... Um, another reason maybe why I don't find many metal items is that I'm purely an eyes only searcher. So I'm purely scanning the surface of the foreshore. Uh, whereas people with metal detectors probably get a higher hit rate because they can go a few inches deeper than me. Number 10 is pins. Um, an iconic metal find from the foreshore. Um, Handmade pins, by which I mean that the top bit is wound on to the stem by hand. So these are pre-industrial pins. Uh, they're difficult to date any time from medieval um, through post-medieval. Um, a lot of clothing, in Tudor times especially, such as elaborate ruffs, were held together with hundreds of pins. So it's not a surprise that they're a very easy thing to find on the foreshore and they occur in patches. I don't know whether that's just because the river has sorted them that way. Um, but at different lengths, little ones and long ones there. Um, other clothing attachments you might find are lace shapes. Uh, these have a hole in the wider end for stitching and obviously the end of a lace or ribbon would be um, secured with one of those, making it easier to um, put through the hole. And then these things, now some people think these are little twists to hold together bundles of 50 or 100 pins, and that might be one of their uses, they may have had many different uses. Um, but I saw in the Mary Rose Museum, uh, where they'd found clothing in a chest, that they were actually arranged either side of the front of a bit of clothing and then a ribbon or string would go through them and then you could pull your thing there. So the equivalent of buttonholes really and they would just be sewn on in pairs opposite one another like that. Number nine, buttons. Again, quite a common find on the foreshore. It's interesting because a lot of them have maker's marks, especially these Victorian style buttons. Uh, MacDonald of Waterloo Road in London and Chetwin patent buttons. So you can research them. I tried Googling these, but I got nothing useful on either of these, but a uh, little Victorian buttons turn up quite frequently. There are also uniform buttons, uh, which are nice uh, pewter buttons from previous centuries. So that is my number nine. Moving on then to number eight, tokens. Uh, lead alloy tokens come in a variety of sizes uh, and they're also fairly common to pick up. I presume they're used for small change and there's a lot of different designs from medieval right through to post-medieval. Um, this is a particularly large crude one. There's a sort of box hatching design on one side and then the remains of something which may have been someone's initials on the other side. Um, so I imagine this is probably a post medieval one judging by its size uh, but totally unofficial and made by people just to provide small change uh, which wasn't common really until the 18th century.
So, keeping with the coin theme for number seven, uh, this little square item with the design either side is not a coin but is a coin weight. So, in the days when coinage was mainly silver and gold, uh, basically it was worth its weight in bullion. Um, so, if you're a merchant, you might deal with lots of different types of foreign coins uh, and you would use weights to check their validity, to check that they were the right weight of silver or gold. So they had a sort of crude representation of the coin on them. I think this is probably for an English uh, royal or noble. It seems to have a king uh, sitting in a ship holding an orb there. Uh, it's difficult to see what's on the other side. It might be a hand, in which case it was made in Amsterdam. Um, they, they made a lot of these coin weights for different denominations of European gold coins, generally. Uh, but it's interesting, you know, London being a great centre of trade, uh, that you've got this little uh, coin weight, which I think is probably going to be 16th century. Um, there's a picture coming up of a whole set a little bit later, but you would buy them in sets and then use them to check different denominations of European coins. So that's number seven. Number six is also very much to do with trade. Um, do you know what this is? Four little circles. Uh, it's got a rose there and a R on there. Uh, it is a cloth seal. So when you made bolts of cloth, uh, at the point of manufacture, you would attach a seal to them which carried different information, uh, where it was made, uh, who made it, uh, what type of cloth it was, might also be included or might not, uh, and then it would be folded in the middle and the AR bit would go through that and then through the cloth and so it was attached and then when it arrived in London, obviously, uh, people could see what it was. Now AR with the crown above it is for Queen Anne. Uh, so this dates it very nicely from 1702 to 1714 or thereabouts. And there's a rose there, like a Tudor rose, um, you know, which is a royal symbol as well. So a four part cloth seal there. Okay, we're in our top five. Now, do you know what this little fellow is that I found eyes only on the foreshore? Um, it is the winding key for a pocket watch. Uh, probably Georgian in date. It's got rather a nice uh, flower motif either side. So it's quite an elaborate uh, little key there. And this would be used... That be the winder I think or you've got two little winders um, which you would wind up your pocket watch your Georgian pocket watch in the 18th century or early 19th century so that's number five Number four is a rather intriguing find, a bit of a mystery. Uh, it's part of a copper 
printing plate so it's engraved and then that would be used to print onto paper and it's a map you'll see it much better in the photograph afterwards uh, but there's a road or a river running there and little trees and fields there sadly no identification uh, this is the earlier face and then the other side it's been reused that way around I think so of course everything's back to front um, because it prints the right way around uh, this I think has been re-engraved later probably in the 18th century uh, with a map of the English Channel so you've got the big word channel at the bottom and at the top very interestingly you've got Brighthelmston and Shoreham with a few numbers which are probably their position now Brighthelmston is the very early name for Brighton before it became developed uh, in the early 19th century uh, the Regency period so it's part of a map of the channel on one side and part of a map of uh, the countryside or the suburbs of a town maybe London be nice to know uh, on the other side but I've not been able to trace any either of the maps that this come from uh, if any of you are able to help I'd be very interested to hear who the engraver was eventually I'll come across it and I'll find out who engraved it it might be that the engraver of this side is a totally different engraver to the other side so anyway that's my Number four. Top three. And number three is the oldest coin that I've picked up on the foreshore. Now, uh, this was many years ago, and I was just chatting to a really old mudlarker who's passed away now. And he was telling me how he found a Saxon gold coin about 10 feet from where we were standing. I don't know if he was making it up or not. Possibly true. Um, but a little later I found this little copper coin uh, in the same place. And it's a rose farthing. Because you can see it's got a rose on this side of Charles I. So this dates from 1625 to around 1644. Um, Charles I obviously famous um, due to the English Civil War and ended up being beheaded in London, not a mile from the Thames. So this is a farthing, which is a quarter of a penny. And you can just see the Latin inscription, Carolus, uh, Mag, Carol, Charles the Great. Uh, and then on the other side, England, Scotland and France, I think it is. So he's still claimed to be, and Rex, King, King of France. Uh, and it's got some beautiful Thames patina on it. So it's a little bit of a shine, you know, it's still got a little bit of coppery shine, even after all these years. Uh, and you can see, if I don't drop it too much, um, a little triangle of a different colour. Now that's not where it's corroded, but that is actually a wedge of a different alloy, or it's more coppery or less coppery, I'm not sure. But it's an anti-forgery device, so they put this little wedge of metal into the top of the coin, always in the same position, um, and that just stops them forging them, although they did make many forgeries of them. Um, it's not a rare or particularly valuable coin, um, but it's very special to me anyway. So a farthing of Charles I. And there's a crown with scepters through it there. So, top two, my number two, is this wonderful Georgian shoe buckle, made of pewter, so it's not particularly precious in its day, um, but what's nice is because of the Thames conditions, a lot of the iron buckle on the back, the iron catch, 
or thing you put through your shoe um, top is preserved, um, which you wouldn't get in farmland. Um, so this is a dandy buckle. It's a shoe buckle for a Georgian gentleman, um, and it would look fantastic. Probably quite um, bright colours when it was new, shiny. Um, so imagine a pair of these on your shoes uh, when you went off and did the town in Georgian times. So this was found in a place where I've never found anything of any description, even a scrap of interesting pottery. And I was just walking there to get to somewhere else. And there it was, just lying there, waiting to be picked up. So that's my number two find, which is a marvellous Georgian pewter and iron shoe buckle, a dandy shoe buckle. Which brings us to my number one find, uh, which is this little bag seal or cloth seal, a merchandise seal. Again, this would have been folded over and pressed together to seal some merchandise of some sort. Um, rather a plain looking thing, don't you think? Why is this my number one? Ah, because of what's on the other side. Uh, the merchant's initials, IS or SI, so I could be also... Uh, stand for J in those times, so it could be J.S. John Smith would be an obvious one. Um, but rather nicely they put their date on it and the date is rather a good date for a London find, 1666. So the year of the Great Fire of London. Now I.S., um, whoever he was, or possibly she I suppose, um, need not come from London. Um, it's just arrived in London on merchandise either just before the fire or just afterwards. Um, obviously, probably after the fire, I would say, um, because they had to replace and repair a huge amount of stuff. So everyone was buying lots of different materials and this might have arrived on some cloth or linen or um, carpet or curtain, who knows. Um, I checked online and another one identical was found in Buckinghamshire. So whether that's the point of origin or not, but this is my number one metal find, uh, beautiful condition, uh, merchant seal IS 1666.